Hey everyone, good evening. It's really lovely to see you here. Um, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, my name is Colin Levin. I'm director of the Frank Ratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry, uh, the research laboratory of the College of Fine Arts, dedicated to uh, atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Um, tonight, it's my terrific pleasure to uh, host an evening here of folks who are really world experts in thinking about the intersection of architecture and fabrication. Uh, to introduce them is Professor Molly Steenson from the CMU School of Design. So how many times in your life do you get to introduce robot whisperers? I think this might be the first. Um, I am beyond delighted to moderate tonight um, this panel with Maria Yablonina. Uh, Yablo please tell me. Uh, Yablon. OK. And Madeline Gannon. Um, Madeline Gannon is a PhD candidate here at Carnegie Mellon, where in a matter of minutes, she will be done with her dissertation that she will be defending in December. Um, she runs a studio called Atonaton, and um, she was she did her architecture degree at Florida International University. And I'm going to steal a peek at my notes again um, for Maria's um, exact exact affiliation. She is a doctoral candidate and research associate at the Institute for Computation, Computational Design and Construction at the University of Stuttgart. And um, she works on robots, fabrication, um, a, a good interest in filaments, definitely great hair. We, dis we decided we could agree on hair. Um, but uh, what I want to point out that I think is so fascinating about this work is that both Maria and Madeline cause you to consider what robots do, what they don't do, and um, how we relate to them in different and beautiful ways. Um, when I showed Maria's work to someone recently, um, their response was, oh, wait, they're kissing, as she show, as different different robotic elements move toward each other. You'll see, I think, as as she speaks what what she's what I'm talking about, perhaps. But there's and as you look at Madeline's work with um and particularly with Mimas the robot and robots that get bored with you and that tease you and and seem to want you to interact with them. There's something about this that makes us understand who we are in the eyes of these robots. And um, so I'd like to introduce these two designers. And did we decide who's going first? Maria, you're going to go first? OK, so first we'll have Maria, then we'll have Madeline. And then this is truly an AMA. These, these folks are here for you to ask questions about robots, art, fabrication, filaments, et cetera. So um, please, let's start with a big round of applause for Maria. Hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm super excited to show you my work. Uh, so my name is Maria. I come from, I'm currently based in Stuttgart at the Institute for Computational Design and Construction, and I thought I'll start with um, a little bit of context on what we do at the Institute. Um, so we, um, at the Institute, we aspire to develop novel fabrication processes for new materials that haven't been used in architecture before due to their fabrication limitations. And a good example of that is fiber composite, um, be that glass fiber or carbon fiber or other types of fibers that are very widely used in aerospace and car manufacturing and in other industries, but are not really applicable to architecture and often aren't even applicable to design. So here we can see one of the propellers of the wind turbine. Um, which is a giant mold that they, they then uh, lay composite material onto. And it makes a lot of sense for fabrication of something that has many, many copies of the same thing. When you try to translate that into a field where uniqueness of every element is highly valued, that becomes not really feasible because production of just the mold is already too expensive. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to move away from the mold-based processes into using these materials in different ways often deploying robots um, to kind of create these fabrication systems that would allow us to translate these materials into large-scale architectural projects. And one of the examples of that project is this pavilion that we have completed two years ago now, maybe three, I'm a little bit confused, three years ago, let's say. Um, 
So what we did here is we used an inflatable formwork um, that ended up being integrated into the final building. So we inflated this shape, we had a robotic arm inside of it, and it would lay carbon fiber onto the inflated formwork. And once the carbon fiber that was pre-impregnated with resin would cure, we could cut out the um, entrances and kind of have it as an architectural shape that stood there for over a year. Um, and after that has been unfortunately taken down. Um, so that's more or less the context of what we do at the Institute. Um, in terms of what I do in my personal work, um, it's a little bit different, and that's what I would like to focus on in this talk. Um, so my personal journey started with Diane, and Diane is the creature you can see on the screen. Uh, she's terrifying and super awesome. Um, unfortunately, this, this picture has been taken, I think, four years ago now. Um, Diane is no longer with us. But Diane used to live in my lab, uh, and I was very fascinated by how her and other creatures like her built really large, very intricate structures while being very small and not even having a plan or a drawing for what they're building. So I tried to set up this um, kind of um, DIY research facility for looking at how Diane is actually building her webs. And I was doing two things. I was tracking her position in space, and I was also scanning the web um, every couple of days or every day. Uh, so the data I got out of that was semi-useful, semi-completely unprocessable by someone with my expertise, especially at the time. But uh, what I did understand, um, and that was actually really fascinating to really learn something new from just observing the animal and actually performing all of the digital scanning procedures, is that there are basically two stages in which a spider like this builds three-dimensional um, spatial webs. First stage is when they lay these longitudinal fibers that are basically formwork. And then the second stage that starts after roughly two days, um, it stops moving on the walls of the box. It's in, like exclusively moving on the web itself. And it's basically reinforcing it, doing this really fa funny dancing pattern, which in the beginning we're like, what's wrong with the spider? It's like trickling and really strange. But yeah, it makes perfect sense in order to you know efficient, efficiently move and lay enough material in specific areas, move in a zigzag. So that small research project brought me to this slide where I was, you know, industrial robots are great and I've um, worked with them a bunch on these larger group projects, but why don't we create a situation where it's a smaller machine building a larger system similar to what the spider does. So I started building my own machines um, and I've been showing this slide for a while now and the more I show it, the more embarrassing it becomes. Uh, but I still think it's important. Uh, I've started with barely knowing anything about anything and ended up with a robot that um, I'm still using every now and then. I mean, it's not the same piece of hardware, but it's the same conceptual robot. It basically has three main parts. Um, it's a vacuum motor, a locomotion assembly, which is full motors and wheels, and an effector assembly that allows it to attach thread to anchors which you're gonna see in more detail. And more importantly, it can autonomously navigate in space and it basically has these two modes, one manual, one autonomous. In manual mode, I can drive it myself from a joystick and in autonomous mode, it basically just moves to the target point that is defined in the digital space um, of my fabrication software. So another thing that it can do, it can attach fiber to hooks that have been pre-installed by a human. Um, and it can also interact with other robots that are exactly like itself. And that's the famous kissing slide. Um, so it can pass uh, the, the material from one robot to another, it can attach it to environment, and it can navigate in the environment. So the setup for fabrication process looked roughly like this. I had two walls, two robots, and two cameras, one camera per wall, tracking these little fiducial marker markers on each machine. And within that setup, they could collaboratively create, um, maybe not necessarily an architectural, architecture scale element, but definitely furniture scale and human scale uh, object that could then be actually even used, maybe not in the most comfortable way, but um, yeah, they're definitely kissing in there, uh, which is really funny. I, I feel like I get that almost every time I talk about my work. It's like, they're so cute. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, there's this these three main routines that they're performing, navigating, uh, interacting, and anchoring to the environment. And there's a specific kind of sequence in which it needs to be performed in order to create these types of structures. Um, at, after the end of that project, I also tested it a few times on exterior building facades, hoping that one day maybe I'll build something bigger. 
Um, but also after finishing that project, I started reflecting on it, thinking of how initially my aim was to limit myself from the limitations of an industrial arm, which is both kind of price limitation and installation complexity limitation as well as a scale limitation. But through that process, literally got myself into a corner uh, where that's the only setup that I can now fabricate in. And I would really want to see it, you know, be more flexible. And that's when I was invited to do an installation for Milan Design Week, which was much bigger. Um, and I started thinking, okay, how do we how do we solve this problem? How do we get out of this very confined corner, 90 degree corner space? So my solution was add another robot, um, another new task specific robot that can collaborate with an existing system and kind of really broaden this, what I now refer to as ecology of robots. So I had to mildly redesign the um, collaboration effector and the way the bobbin is being passed from one machine to another. But essentially it's the same concept. They have two walls, two machines, and instead of meeting each other at the corner, they now have this little helper that just transports the material from one wall to another. And that's how the interaction happens. Yep, there we go. Uh, and yeah, the hooking is basically performed in the same way as in the previous project. And it travels seven and a half meters across the gallery space which was unexpectedly difficult. Um, you know, when you upscale things like, oh, it's the same thing, it's just a little bit bigger. No, it's not. It was, it was a crazy project. Um, but anyways, the result of that um, is a large scale structure. In this case, it was not designed to support a human because the walls weren't designed to support a human. Uh, to tell you a secret, the walls actually moved at some point during the fabrication process, which was a total disaster. Uh, but it was okay. I mean, you know, we survived. Um, and we got really good feedback from the audience. Uh, one thing that I was doing with this project that was new for me, I was running live demos, um, and that was incredibly rewarding. Uh, also very funny, because there were a lot of children, and every time I would give a controller to a kid, going like, hey, you want to drive this robot that's on the wall, the kid would be excited about the controller. It's like, oh my god, it's an Xbox controller. It's like, yeah, there's a robot on the wall. I don't care, <laughs> Xbox controller. It was really funny. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about while working on these two projects, and it's always been kind of at the back of my mind, uh, the slides that I showed earlier, you know, industrial machine versus a mobile machine. Um, and over time I've added that tiny plus uh, in the middle of that slide. Um, kind of starting to think how I really like the idea of multiple robots collaborating in the same space. I really like the idea of multiple different types of robots or different species of robots collaborating in the same space. And how it actually makes a lot of sense to create these environments where different robots from different backgrounds or, or different kind of, um, I don't know, places come together and there is an environment both in a digital and a physical space where they can interact and can collaborate. So I envision this to become a much larger system where it could be both robots that I develop or other people develop, more like DIY machines as well as industrial robots and potentially other types of locomotion systems like quadcopters, because you know, quadcopters are cool. Um, so starting to think about it, um, I always begin thinking what's the interface, both on the software and the hardware side. And on the hardware side so far I've developed a few effectors that allow for robot-robot collaboration. One is a spatula, um, which is a very basic thing, but it, again, it kind of, it's on this perpetual mission of getting rid of the limitations of each machine and having these collaborative environments where each machine is performing the thing that the other one can't, and together they do things that they wouldn't be able to do separately. Um, so yeah, this is more, this is kind of uh, behind the scenes work in progress. It's something I'm still working on and kind of figuring out how to transform that into more of a project-based thing. And hopefully, <laughs> guess what happens after the video ends? The, robot the, the drone obviously crashes dramatically. Um, but yeah, hopefully um, at some point this will become a more of a ecosystem uh, where I can plug and play, where I can plug different machines into it um, and create these collaborative environments where totally different robots from totally different places uh, can do cool stuff together and be friends. Thank you. So Marie and I met actually a couple years ago as a part of the Autodesk Artists in Residence, Residence Program. Um, so both of us, that, that, last, that last project was a part of Pier 9 there. And I'm gonna show some work also from Pier 9. 
but we we didn't quite overlap. We were just just barely um, apart. We're separate cohorts. So it's been nice to have you around for the past for the past couple of days and really get to hang out and, and play and think about the future of robotics. Great. So um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. I hope you've enjoyed your dumplings so far. Um, my name is Madeline Gannon. I am a PhD student here, as Molly said, and I run a, a research studio called Automaton. And I also happen to be a research fellow here at the Studio for Creative Inquiry, where I get to play with robots all day. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to show my work with you. And a lot of what I do tries to reimagine these big industrial monsters as creatures instead of things. So I am a designer, a researcher, and a robot whisperer. And a lot of what I do um, focuses on how recontextualizing automation. So if you see these machines here, you might see um, a really uh, 100 years of, of innovation in manufacturing. You might see these things as job killers and, and threats to our way of living. I see these things as having superpowers, that they have superhuman strength, superhuman speed, endurance, reliability, and precision. And unfortunately, they've just been used in a really boring way, and they've been trapped inside of factories. So I look to create ways to transform these tools of automation into ways that can enhance, augment, and expand human capabilities, not replace them. And this is the future that I'm trying to make. I'm really passionate about inventing better ways to communicate with machines that can make things. For a long time, industrial robots have been the culprit of automation and replacing human labor. Basically, all the easy tasks to automate have been automated. Now what we're working on is um, using these tools to enhance or augment human labor. And that to me is very exciting. Industrial robots are really fantastic CNC machines, you put a different tool at the end of the arm and all of a sudden they can do a whole different thing. So in the morning you can be doing spot welding, in the evening you can be doing painting. It's just highly adaptable. Another thing that I'm really working towards is finding ways to bring these machines out of factories and into live environments. So onto construction sites or onto film sets. There's chance for unpredictable objects like people to be moving into the environment. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to build the system to give this robot eyes so that it could actually see me and we can safely collaborate in a shared space. If I'm wearing or if I'm holding these motion capture markers, and it knows where I am in space, it knows how I'm moving in space, now all of a sudden we can give the machine a nuanced understanding of our intention in that space. You can get someone who's never seen a robot before and have them begin to do creative things with just a couple minutes of interacting with the machine. So this is what I set out to do, is to, to find a way to transform these uh, large, dangerous, powerful, and, and fairly dumb machines um, into ways that, that I can safely collaborate with a person. And um, there's a huge problem with these machines. And if you look into their user manual, you are just inundated with visions of your impending doom. Um, and even in industry, you know, state-of-the-art human-robot interaction in factories is still highly separated and segmented. Um, you know, these machines are hardened steel and I am soft, squishy flesh, and those things really shouldn't come into contact with one another too often. Um, and, and part of coming from the design world and not the robotics world is that uh, sometimes you don't know what you're not supposed to do. So one of my first projects actually working with robotics was to make a, a back massaging robot. Um, so this is the world's first back interface with a robot. So this has some sensors in, in the in the end effector there that when you lean harder, it sort of massages you harder. When you lean forward a little bit, um, it, it backs off a bit. Um, and it was a really great way to think about all of the ways this machine could kill you and how to try to mitigate that from happening. 
Um, and I work a lot, uh, in the past I've worked a lot on this, and just trying to make these machines easier to use, cheaper to use, building open source hardware projects and open source software projects for quickly um, getting over the technical, needless technical hurdle of using these machines into ways that we can start doing something creative. And a lot of that has to do with real-time control. So these guys, these are not industrial robots, these are collaborative robots. Um, if, the, if the orange one is, is a, a big beast, this is more like a, uh, a little puppy. Um, but if you get hit with it, it still feels like a motorized baseball bat. It just stops after it hits you. Um, and in working with these machines, this is ABBA, the, the orange robot. Uh, it was really incredible, this bond that we developed, albeit one-sided, um, over the, the course of four months of working together. And it reminded me of um, you know, daring feats of, of robot taming or working with an exotic creature in new ways. And I was fortunate enough to be able to explore these ideas in a um, public setting at the Design Museum last year. So I was invited to transform ABBA, to bring this robot um, from a, a personal interaction to something that the general public could um, experience in a show called Fear and Love. And the curator asked me to think about the complexities of automation and how we have to grapple with this future of automation and uh, come up with an immersive installation that could help people start to think through all of these complexities. Um, so I decided to bring a robot to live in the museum for six months, and I uh, wanted to treat it like a zoo creature that uh, you could see, perhaps have your first point of contact with this kind of alien thing and let you come face to face with it. Uh, but that meant developing a whole new way of sensing that I couldn't use for ABBA, the orange robot. Um, with ABBA, I was holding a marker, and it's great for one person who's trained with it, but in a museum, when there's going to be hordes of people moving through time, um, time after time, day after day, that what we really need is a markerless system. So this is how Mimas, the robot in the design museum, actually sees you. Um, she sees everyone around her. Um, so here are all the people around her enclosure. And she's looking at you from above, almost a bird's eye view. And from that basic knowledge of these blobs moving in space, um, I can take that quantitative data and map it to qualitative aspects. So for example, I know someone's position, I know their height, I know how long they've been there, I know how close they've been to the robot for how long. And I can, for example, begin to um, extrapolate some ideas about trust. So if you've been there for a long time and if you're really close to the robot, then perhaps um, you and the robot have built up some trust and it's more likely to come to you out of all the crowds of people around. Um, so that, that's the vision system that, that helps her see the world. And uh, robots actually are quite simple to communicate to. Um, so here, all a robot needs is a point and an orientation that you feed it over time. So if you can make a point and if you can make a plane, you can talk to a robot. Um, and it looks like this, really. This is with a motion capture marker, just testing out a, a safe sandbox for the robot. So this is the information that I'm feeding the robot. But when you transfer that abstract geometry into a physical form, you get something quite different. You get this kind of embodied, personable experience where the technology drifts away and you have this raw experience with a lifelike machine. So this is Mimas in her enclosure. This is a ABB 6700 stroke 200 slash 2.65 robot. And she took a, a good six month break off of an assembly line in, um, in England and got to live inside the design museum. Um, and bu in building all this technology, really what I'm trying to do is get to the point of interaction design. Like, what I really want to do is design interaction with these autonomous fabrication machines. And unfortunately, that those machines don't exist yet, so I have to build the tech too. Um, but these are some of the early vignettes for some of the interactions with it. And what I've been thinking about a lot of this is really just spatial relationships with these machines, whether it approaches you from above, whether it approaches you from below, whether it comes at you quickly, whether it tries to get your attention, uh, whether it poses with you. And it was pretty incredible the, um, the type of range of emotion that I could see afar, you know, a continent away, where people would start to empathize with this machine to see it as friendly or cute 
or whether they thought um, Mimas was flirting with them, um, or whether they would tease Mimas. Um, um, some people, I think, took the message a little too strong and, and projected some kind of lewd and crude behaviors on it. And then another wonderful interaction that I saw this spawning was, was also distrust. Like, why is this obviously dangerously looking thing, why do I see this as cute? Like, is something wrong here? And that's a question that we don't ask often enough with, with technology, especially robots that are in domestic settings. Um, so so it's, it's quite a wonderful experience to get that whole range of, of response. Um, yeah, with this machine, it's a, it's a non-humanoid robot. It ha doesn't have a face, doesn't have eyes, has no, none of our features. It just has how it moves, how it sounds, and how it poses. And with just those simple ingredients, we can do a lot to bring this machine to life, um, to give it a personality, to give it a relatability to the people around it. And it's those hypersensitivity to those details that take a technology that's been around for 50 years and transforms it and repurposes it for something new and more human. It's been quite engaging building technology that's so attentive and, and caring. Um, and it's an optimism that I bring to it. But all of us have to want to build that future, to take these machines from replacing people and, and bring them new life to augment us. Um, I'm going to start by uh, asking a couple of machines. Oh, you do want to? Oh, I see. I'll, I'll keep on spinning. If I have a spinning stool, I'm going to spin. Ah, it oh no! And then you'll drill holes into the ground, and it will be. Um, there was something that came to mind in um, in both of your brief presentations in different kinds of ways, and it was this question about emergence and emergent behavior, emergent intelligence. Um, in fact, Maria, I think the word you were talking, you were talking about Diane being terrifying and super awesome and large and intricate. And yet what, what it was, was her seemingly emergent behavior in a space that you began to respond to. And similarly, I think that there's a notion of emergent intelligence that appears in, in both of in, in your work as well, but in, in both of your work. And so I wondered if you could say something about that. Um, sure. That's really, that's really nice that you wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, when we see animal builders, uh, most of the time, the way they create their structures or their objects, they don't have a plan or they don't have a drawing. It's basically a set of behaviors or a set of rules that they follow in order to create these objects. And I think that's what I aspire to achieve with my machines. They're definitely not that at the moment. I'm pretty... Um, I'm a bit of a control freak. I know exactly which point needs to be connected to which point. Um, but I think we are getting there. I think we're definitely um, getting closer to the point when uh, the robot can sense its environment and react to it immediately and then make decisions rather than me telling the robot which decisions to make. Um, I don't know how soon that's going to happen, but it's definitely something I'm aiming to look into closer. So robot sensing emergent emergent modes of robot sensing. Yeah. Yeah. Adeline. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Definitely with um, a lot of the ways that I, especially for Mimas, that's something that I really explored emergence with. So um, I'm using simulation to tell the robot where to go. And I'm not really telling the robot where to go. I'm telling it uh, a ranking algorithm for who's the most interesting person. And then the robot sort of finds her way to that person. And that uses a um, variation on a flocking algorithm that was written in the 80s. And um, the result of that is that it looks lifelike, it looks intelligent, it looks responsive. And um, the machine has a lot of latency because it's not designed for real-time control. It's designed for repetitive moving. But what that renders on through this machine is like um, a delayed reflex. Um, so there's kids playing back and forth and the, and the robot is back a cycle and I'm like oh what latency what how terrible but it, it's actually quite playful because it's it's how an animal would respond with a delayed response um, so this idea of emergence of just putting very simple rules in play and kind of just defining the edges of that universe and letting the robot sort of find its way there is a, um, a technique that I lean heavily on 
to give this thing sort of more lifelike qualities. It also reminds me of the fact that as, as we've discussed, this question of boredom goes back to the 1950s. If you look at the work of someone like Gordon Pask and the question of finding interesting and how how a programmer, robot whisperer, uh, designer, architect defines a notion of interesting. I know Ben Snell is dealing with this right now in his capstone project. You had you worked on uh, worked off of a flocking mechanism from the 1980s. Gordon Pask did his own musicolor experiments and then worked with Cedric Price in the 1970s to do other versions of that. Um, I have one more question for each of you, and um, and then we'll turn it to everybody in the audience. And I think we've got enough time here to hear from every single person. So the goal is to ask uh, ask robot whisperers anything, um, but. You've talked about this from the perspective of being designers and being architects or working within architecture um, and robotics, but I'd like to ask the question that often gets asked, which is, what does this mean for um, a definition of architecture, a definition of, of design, where it is defined by these kinds of interactions as opposed to the other way around? <laughs> we, we we talked about like one a really hard question. I was like, oh Maria, that, that's a great question, Molly. Maria, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. So over the course of my work, what what I have been shown is that that I really started in fabrication. I started talking with CAD CAM machines, CNC machines like routers and printers, and um, more and more it's gone from you know a software system that creates a physical artifact to how I interact with that thing that creates a physical artifact to how I interact directly with that machine, which now happens to be a robot, which is just a CNC machine. Um, so my work has become less about physical objects, less about um, architecture and design objects traditionally, and more about um, uh, bypassing all of that and just engaging directly with this intelligent machine that will hopefully um, help me or we can have some sort of uh, impactful relationship rather than it just being a servant or a tool. Um, but I think about this a lot. Like I, I, I was very fortunate to be, in, you know, cold called based on a YouTube video by a curator to go into the design museum, and that's a museum that exhibits objects. And this was the first time that they've had uh, a media art artist come in, someone who does interactive installations. And it was a lot of growing pains for me for my first time doing a show of that magnitude, and them for having this massively ambitious interactive installation with a deadly thing, uh, live um, and on supervised it was there was a lot of like like um the curator even commenting that like what's really on display is not the robot but the software mm -hmm. um so this is indicative of a, of a sea change of of how code and matter is affecting our physical experience of space in my mind and a question on the way too of what is how do you archive memes <laughs> um well in terms of what these types of technologies mean for design. I guess what both me and my whole institute are trying to get to is creating these new ways of fabricating with materials that weren't really fabricable with before. Uh, but what I personally try to get to is also, I believe that through developing these smaller machines, I'm eventually moving towards democratizing some of that fabrication because um, especially if we look into academia, uh, not every educational institution can afford a big industrial arm, but probably, probably my robots aren't ready to be used by other people, but at some point those can be very affordable fabrication machines that could then um, be deployed and also be deployed in spaces that a larger machine can't be deployed in. So like a public space or a building facade or something like that. And they could also potentially create structures that are continuously changing. So it's not a designer designing a final structure. It's rather you just deploy the robot and see what they come up with, how they respond to the environment and what they create. Shall we accept some questions from our audience? I think they're ready. And Tom has a microphone, so he'll walk over to you and put it in your hands. Caroline. Hi. Hello. Hey. You're both, you're all awesome. Um, <laughs> so what do like, like traditional roboticists 
are the ones who are making these things so that they can be used as servants or for non-artistic purposes. Have you interacted with any of those people in your creation of those things? And like, what do they think of this project? Um, so I've, I've interacted heavily with ABB Robotics, which is the, the they were a sponsor of the sh show. They, they helped with the health and safety systems a lot um, and because it's, it is to bring this thing into a um, unsupervised six month installation uh, that we actually had to go above and beyond the international safety standards for industrial robots. Like they're designed to go into factories and there's an acceptable level of danger in factories that when you bring this machine into a public setting, you, you know, you have to childproof it. Um, so that that interaction was was great. The the one anecdote that was interesting is that uh, a lot of times when these installers get called in, it's because of sabotage. That that workers who are um, on these assembly lines in these factories that robots are coming into will tinker with the machines to um, have them not work as effectively. And um, they were they said, oh well, if the machine act, acted cute, uh, maybe they wouldn't sabotage it. And I thought that was interesting and also incredibly manipulative. Um, um, but but that's the that's the one kind of anecdote. Uh, a lot of a lot of the novelty that I bring in this exploration that isn't in robotics uh, really comes from that design lens. I, I think robotics is mostly focused with actuation and um, deployability and planning and and we're getting to a point now where the technology is so robust that's coming out of the lab that we know we can get a machine from A to B safely without hurting anyone or anything. Now we have the opportunity for, for folks who are outsiders to begin to explore more meaningful impact that those technologies can have. Um, I would say the general response that I've been getting so far through mostly conferences and kind of more academic environments, uh, people are super excited to see that kind of work. They've never seen um, that type of approach to robotics. So it's less, I would say if you compare the fields, it's less about making a perfectly optimized robot to perform a perfect task. It's more creating a larger conceptual um, body of work that shows what a robot can, this can, like this can do, rather than really figuring out every single um, like perfect piece of hardware and software. And people are generally quite excited about that. Yeah. Next question, Dan Lockton over here, and then we'll go up here. Thanks. Um, it's, yeah, it was really interesting to see both talks together in a way, to see the kind of slightly different approaches that you've, you've taken, obviously to different kinds of projects. But one of the things that seemed in common is like neither of you have made the aesthetics of the robot, like you haven't kind of pandered to humans what we might assume our expectations are in terms of what it would look like. Like, you know, a lot of robot projects or a lot of the stuff in this area are the kind of more um, interactive end of it or more sort of speculative end would make things that look like, I don't know, kind of images of ro what robots look like in science fiction. And you've both done things that are, are kind of, have almost got their own aesthetic, either because it's what an industrial robot looks like, or it's something that emerges very much from the task and the, and the, I guess the inspiration, but not completely that, Maria, I don't know, like it looked like some of yours are like initially inspired by what spiders do, but then you've gone in a you know, in a different direction with the aesthetics. And I just, I just wonder, is there anything like, is this, is this a kind of new aesthetic form that is not dictated to by what kind of, you know, what we think robots should look like, but this is more like their own form. I don't know what that means, but like, is, is this a thing, I guess? I have, I have a question uh, on that. Like, <laughs> I'm wondering if this annoys you as much as it annoys me. I hate robots that have screens with eyeballs on it. It annoys me to no ends yeah. because they have their own body language. They have their own way of communicating and, and plastering this artifice on it is a way of like not um, engaging that whatsoever. And I don't know, I, I guess, so I think about this all the time. It, it, yeah, it's it like it's like nails on a chalkboard to me walking through the Robotics Institute often. But anyway, um, but I'm going to pass this to you because I'm I'm quite curious about how you think about this too. Um, I think I agree. I, I really like the idea of robots um, kind of developing their own personality and developing their own aesthetic through function. The way I approach my design process for the machines themselves, it's purely functional. It's like I need to put these uh, routines together into some kind of shape that doesn't fall apart. Um, and then it emerges, but then, which is also very interesting because 
as I go through the design process and as the shape kind of gets there, I learn how to interact with it and I kind of get to know it. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of a back and forth process, but it's definitely, it's not a, a lot of conscious aesthetic choices. It's more of an emerging aesthetics that I'm currently okay with. Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention about that, too, is I know a lot of Dan's research right now is in the area of metaphors. And so when we're talking about robots and aesthetics, we're also talking about our metaphors for them. Hi. Um, my question was about um, whether uh, you saw, and you briefly mentioned a negative example of people anthropomorphizing the robot. Of um, And as more designers get pulled on um, to make robots look cute and approachable, do you think there are any negative, what do you think we can do about the more negative sides of people over anthropomorphizing or over trusting robots as they come into our spaces, as we're gonna have drones around us, probably advertising to us soon. What do you think, what do you think we can do as artists to sort of, while still showing different ways of using robots that are more, uh, that, that are more human, uh, how do you think we can kind of fight that response of I think I think that's a great question it's something I think about often a lot of a lot of my answer to is just diversity of thought like like exploring many alternative futures that aren't based on 1960s science fiction um, and and for me a lot of the, the it's still very nascent to have designers working in this field and I'm working as hard as I can to come up with a systemic design language for this. And um, I don't know if it's the right one or not, but it, it works in some um, applications. Right now, there's just not a, there's not enough people working in diverse ways. Like here in Pittsburgh, we're showing off the driverless cars. That's a great example of a, of a non-humanoid dangerous machine, just like the industrial robot that doesn't have a great way of communicating with the people inside nor the people outside and who, the owner of that car is imposing that machine on the public in general. Um, so coming up with, with diverse ways of approaching how these machines can communicate in, in a native tongue, um, I think is quite important. For me, it's all about legibility and transparency and trying to let that rise to the surface. Yeah, I, I can pretty much just agree on what you said. Um, bringing more consciousness into you know, to the public, uh, communicating what exactly these machines can do and how they're being used and why. And yeah, that's that's pretty much the trick, I hope. I don't know. Another question. Um, hi. Um, I'm a little bit confused um, about uh, the calling robots creatures and at the same time wanting to embrace a language of colonialism and sub subjugation. Um, in the description of it as the other, a zoo animal, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and something to be trained like an animal, mm -hmm. as we've seen that that's, you know, something that we're moving away from. We don't have, el we don't have animals in circuses anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they're not gonna train new orcas at SeaWorld anymore. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the history of creatures, including humans that have been put on display mm -hmm. and subjugated to various kinds of regimes of vision and control. I just don't, I guess I'm confused on the one hand, you want me to think of this as a creature, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you want me to think of it as a slave or something under subjugation. Yeah. And I don't know why you want to continue that language when we're trying, I hope, to move away from that in our culture and in education. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point. And, and um, for me, I've been thinking a lot about these machines in uh, the the metaphor of creature is is kind of, I use it as a, as a way of coming up with certain interactions. But really, I think that the narrative of robots today is that we are the master and they are the servant, or they're gonna be the master and we're gonna be their servants. And um, what I'm after, I think, when we, when that's not uh, part of the common conversation about autonomous vehicles or autonomous robots is like, they're gonna have their own agenda. They're gonna be in the wild. And um, uh, we they may be our collaborators, they may be, um, or, or they may have nothing to do with people because they're out in their own complex system doing their own thing with their own form of intelligence. Um, 
so finding finding ways to um, uh, be able to understand what they're doing, and not maybe not tell them what to do, but understand what they're doing. I think is is quite important. Um, that that if I come across a strange machine in an unfamiliar setting that I don't need to whip out an owner's manual to figure out what it's going to do and if it's dangerous to me. Um, but I would still like to answer that question, why do you want to talk about it when you do? Hmm, that's, so, that's my question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for me, yeah, I think I think that's a I think again, like I think that is a really excellent question. The the way that my thinking has transformed that. So a lot of those design decisions came from the fact that it need to, needed to be in a cage for safety reasons. So um, the a lot of the a lot of the. Um, I don't know if I accept it as something nice, and and um, and I don't know if if they should be our servants as well. But I do think that it is quite useful to think about um, uh, domesticated animals versus tamed animals versus wild animals as a as a as a metaphor, just as a metaphor of how these interactions could be. As, I mean. We, yeah, I don't know if you have any. I don't want to hog the the things. I have a I have a lot of thoughts on this. And I would love to, I would love to talk in more detail with you about it and learn a little bit more. But what I see is is um, from a from a standpoint of of human civilization that part of that has been in some relationship to the natural world, and that there are useful design metaphors that we can use just for interactions. Mm, they, sometimes some are symbiotic. Some are symbiotic. Some are collaborative. Some are are um, uh, companionship. There are there are some things that are like we have relationships to things that don't give anything back to us except warm fuzzies and vice versa. But some more really more critical nice. angles to take into account. Definitely. Other question. Oh yeah. Who's uh, next? Simple question. How did you keep your little robot on the wall? Yes. <laughs> It's my favorite question. <laughs> um, it has a vacuum motor in the <laughs> so in the middle of the body it has a vacuum motor and on the other side it has a soft pad that allows that creates somewhat of a seal I so see. it's continuously pumping air. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Ah, one right back there. Hi. So I noticed in some of like when when you were talking about like what you made that I find it really interesting that sometimes like I and the robot were like interchangeable and I and I really think that um, this like have you ever like thought about it in terms of like a self portrait of like you as a designer and, and as an engineer or like a self portrait of the accumulation of like the designers and the engineers um, for with the robots like in like as a collaboration so Um, well, I definitely never thought about that, but I guess that somewhat makes sense. Um, I think w throughout the design process, I mean, the design process is not a very linear process in this case, because you're both designing the, the fabrication process, the material system, and the robot itself, and then kind of all those three things together emerge into something. And I guess throughout that process, of course, it takes on a lot from the person designing it. Um, for me personally, a lot of it um, on the material and fabrication side is built upon the work that's been done at my institute before. So like uh, work with um, filaments, how do you actually wind these things in a particular um, sequence in order to achieve shapes that would be beneficial. So I guess I see it more as a, um, portrait of, if not myself, then of a way to approach this type of material or this type of fabrication process and sequence um, and kind of embody it in a machine that is very task specific rather than a machine that's more generic. 
Yeah, I think about this and, and, you know, when I, maybe I've never really quite thought of it in the terms of a self-portrait, but definitely when I make an interface, I make decisions that are reflective of my own biases and, and, and my own points of view. Even with, with Mimas, for example, that has some emergence behind it and, it and a little bit of its own decision-making process, you know, I sort of set that in motion by the software that I develop. Um, so I guess it is a, a little bit of a, of a self-portrait. I guess this question kind of piggybacks off the last one as well as the the question about uh, robots as creatures and taking the critical approach. So I was also a little uncomfortable and not really able, able to articulate why I was uncomfortable by the idea of the zoo. Um, so my question is like, as an artist and an engineer and a designer, how do you think about the power relationship between you and the robots you're making? Um, as I kind of briefly mentioned before, uh, in the current state of my development, I am pretty much in control. Like, there's very little um, decision making that the robots actually do. Um, most of it is defined by me, but that's definitely something that I would like to move towards um, enabling them with enough uh, both sensing and decision making capacity to actually react and. What's interesting in that situation is, I think, getting to the point when machines create objects that we don't really expect them to create or that we don't expect to be created at all through um, reaction to environment, reaction to users that are in the space, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, right now it's pretty much a very kind of power uh, relationship where I just say, hey, build that, and they do. Yeah, I think for me, with with bringing robots into public spaces, that it has to be safe. Like someone could get really hurt if if this unsupervised thing um, isn't thought of in in a controlled sandbox. Um, but inside that world, I I do what I can to kind of invert the power relationship that we usually see with robots. So you don't control that machine. It has its own way of roam. I don't even control the machine. I, I feed it some information through this ranking system, and then it decides how to get there and what to do. Um, and, and when engaging with a crowd of people, um, it can be quite entertaining to, to watch. Um, but at the, at the core of it, the, the idea that um, those people don't know that they're actually programming the robot in a very traditional way, that instead of using a joystick, to control it, that they're using their bodies and how their bodies to relate to it in space to actually drive it. Um, and again, like a, a lot of what I do is try to build some legibility and and leave some breadcrumbs for how that technology is working, and not try to have it as this black box thing that just looks cute and meanwhile is recording your actions um, and you don't know it. We have a question back there. Right there. Um, so I think both of you are really accurate in the way that you portrayed um, how people see robots now, like what the perspective on it is. Um, and it's kind of this like intimidation, like we don't really understand them. And so as people who have a pretty good grasp on how to interface with robots and how to understand their language, how do you think that you're changing the narrative around that by with your design processes and the projects that you choose? So um, I, I, guess, I guess like the way that you change the narrative is you do work and you put it out in the world and, and you see what sticks and you, you see where the limitations are and you pick up the gauntlet for the next project and you improve and improve and improve. Um, and a, a lot of what I try to advocate for is diversity of thinking that you know this project represents a th uh, one thread of thought towards one potential future, but there's an infinite amount of ways to explore. And right now there's just too narrow a narrative about what our relationship to these intelligent machines that are joining our built environment are going to be. Um, kind of piggybacking on that, even when you talk about robots, um, when you don't have an image, it's funny how very often 
the thing that people imagine is pretty much the same thing. And I guess that's that's one of my missions to broaden that, to turn it into more of an ecology of different types of machines and different functions, something that we may have not even imagined um, can be done by a machine. And also open that open that design space up to people who can invent their own machines and plug it into the global or global larger ecology and kind of start interacting with it, coming up with new processes and new maybe design challenges and fabrication challenges. Over the history of um, computation and robotics, especially in design and architecture, you see this question of, is it a master or a slave? That's what Stephen Coons was saying about how humans and, and uh, how humans are designers and robots would interact. That the ro the slave would be the computer, and I th I want to say that this is something that he was writing in about in about 1963, 1962, something like that. If you haven't been to the show at the Miller Gallery on the second floor from Daniel Cardoso Jacques um, Go, you can kind of see that perspective. And at the same time, that perspective was being challenged by other people like J C R Licklider, who was talking about human computer symbiosis at that point, man-computer symbiosis, um, where humans and computers would work in concert to produce something that was different than the sum of their parts. And I think we find ourselves working back and forth between these different poles. I think we find the, um, it, it is certainly fair to talk about the troubling nature of colonialist narratives playing out in, in robotics. And yet I find myself, I, I almost find that it's like the filament going back and forth and passing a bobbin and trying to come up with new ways to understand the black box and what the black box means for us today. Um, I think notions of uncertainty are very interesting in, in both of your work and in general when we're trying to understand how something is intelligent um, and, and when it becomes something that we didn't make it do that thing, it doesn't mime us, meme us, but, but I mean, but no, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't copy us. It's, it's something, something different. I think there's, there's a kind of complex set of things that robotics research begins to interplay when you're looking at art and design and um, architecture. We have a question back here. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm wondering in terms of, um, it seems like we are uh, empathizing with these robots and giving them a degree of, uh, I guess, um, assuming a certain degree of perception and, and sort of uh, need to have uh, respect and be treated not like a slave or to have a sort of power dynamic with them. Um, I'm wondering though, with relation to how the rest of society views this sort of empathy with um, like farming animals and um, other sort of uh, like having pet fish, having animals that we consider are intelligent, but not intelligent enough to, I guess, warrant human respect. Um, does that perception change when we look at robots? I mean, I, 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 we can we can classify that like a dishwasher. You know, dishwasher is a robot that doesn't even get classified as a robot, a coffee machine, or something like that. You know, something with like one motor of action, actuation, uh, washing machine. So that 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 maybe exists right now, but there isn't there isn't a I don't know the right term, but maybe a design language or a theory that I know of around it. Um, but certainly a lot of, I, and then to like intelligence is something that's relative, right? So a lot of the work that I do um, is, is putting very old systems that, that stimulate someone and broadcast information to someone, to our, our lizard brain on, on things that we, you know, instead of, instead of looking at a screen to see what this robot is about to do, it's communicating with its body language in a way that you can't turn off because it's how animals in the wild move. It's how it's, it's so it's, it taps into something that, that, um, is very innate to how we see the world. And th to me, it, this was a kind of a first project that to sort of look into that frequency, that lower level frequency, to see how we can use that to make more legible, honest, authentic, and communicable systems um, um, that, that don't have great ways of communicating with people um, in, in some productive way. Um, yeah, I 
kind of can only agree here. Uh, hopefully that will somewhat change our perception of other species out there um, through this mode of exploration of our relationship with um, both creatures and machines, machines around us. But I'm not sure if there's any direct uh, relationship there. Yeah, I think I think the conversation is more around artificial intelligence than robots right now. So, you know, the assumption for artificial intelligence is that it's only intelligent if it has human level intelligence. But amoebas have intelligence and bacteria has intelligence and slime molds have intelligence. There's intelligence in the world that isn't comparable to us, but that can be very valuable to learn from. And that those are those are the areas that I'm 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 less interested in in um, humans being the golden rule um, for as you know modeled in our own image and more interested in ways that we can cleverly deploy these systems that have been around for millennia in more meaningful ways hi um something that i think is has been missing a little bit in this conversation about the power dynamic between the person and the robot is that even if one even if you're sort of allowing the robot to make its own decisions somehow like this, this sort of ranking system that you have it's still on the designer to create the software that decides the ranking system. And I'm wondering sort of at which point it stops becoming like your brain, your version of a ranking system for the robot that then you then allow the robot to automatically carry out if there's like a level beyond that. So that I'm imagining there's sort of this level of here robot go do this thing and then here robot you will have this information depending on this information here's how you're going to decide which thing to do. I'm wondering if there's a level beyond that like what we're seeing with artificial intelligence now where it's inventing its own language and AlphaGo which invented new strategies for playing board games that no one had even ever considered playing before and was super surprising to people. Like, I'm wondering if there's a level beyond how we think that robots are going to think and telling them how to make decisions and sort of creating this new way of thinking where they can sort of think for themselves of new ways to think. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think that's, we're on the cusp of that or already there and we're starting to see how that can be problematic when we, when we, um, don't understand what's happening, you know, when when the um, algorithms design themselves. Um, so we were just talking about this that like a, a future specialization in AI might be more forensics or detective work to see discover what this thing is actually doing and, and what went wrong. Um, but but it's it's certainly I think everyone is really excited and there's there's not enough people figuring out what do we want these things to do? What are the desirable effects and what are the uh, uh, negative consequences that could surface from, from all of this incredible technology actually working. And I think one thing to add there is that there's always going to be something that is uh, subjective, be that a uh, designer creating the algorithm and kind of putting their own opinions or uh, their own understanding of world into it, or be that the training data that we use for machine learning algorithms. There's, there's no such thing as yeah, objective. objective exactly. <laughs> So there was, Simon, you had a question, and then Stuart, and then Dan. OK. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about, with people interacting with a new creature, a new, uh, a new system that they haven't encountered before, um, I think about with, with you know, if you're, if you're interacting with something new, you are learning by its reaction to you. And you see that in the, in the, with the, the kids in the museum. and kind of trial and error and seeing how they react. But you also had that um, display that would which kind of show what the robot was seeing from above, mm -hmm. right? And you know, if you get in a self-driving Uber, they like have a little visualization of, of what is the car seeing and you know what how is it processing the world around it. And you know, I see that as an attempt to to, it's a unique thing, right? It's something we can do with, with these systems to some degree. I mean, what we were just talking about, sort of the limitations of that, but um, being able to visualize the brain, the, 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 the thinking behind it, do you find that that is actually useful in helping people understand how to interact with it? Or is it, in your opinion, better to just you know, create these, these realistic um, back and forths between people and have them learn through more of a, a trial and error process, uh, particularly as it relates to trust, if you can speak to that. 
Yeah, I, I can answer quick, quickly. Like, no one should be subjugated to my debug screens. That's terrible. That's terrible user experience design. Um, for me, like, like I think, I think the self-driving cars are a really great thing. Like, I would much rather have a car seat that sort of um, leans into me as I'm making a sharp right turn for me to feel what it's about to do, rather than to see it on a screen for the vector going this way and the de point clouds going that way. Like, the, that um, the debug screens are. are not for everyone that that it's it's um uh, and that was actually a back of house so that wasn't seen but um what we did do for that and this is actually made by kevin who is there we made these aluminum um casings for our sensors and and they're noticeable and bright and so we, we tried to sort of celebrate the the sensing system around that if you stay there long enough you could begin to piece together these breadcrumbs for how this thing was actually seeing you that it wasn't looking through its face its face was it had nothing it was just a naked robot but but the the environment was was presented in a way that you you could be able to piece together that uh, but I think you also do a lot of interesting work with open sourcing most of like or a lot of your software. And I think that's maybe a great tool towards showing the behind the scenes as well as um, kind of talking about trust and having a possibility for a user to understand how these things really work, both through interacting with the piece, but also just going there and looking into how it's done. And I think that's really cool. <laughs> So we had a question up here from Stuart, and then another one, ah, three, okay. We'll go here, 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 all right. Thanks. I really enjoyed your presentations, thank you. Um, I, in this rich brew of topics that have been raised so far, you know, colonialism and power relations and uh, the subjectivity of animals and uh, all, all of that, we haven't really talked about gender, and I wondered if we might. Um, uh, and, and taking as a point of departure, maybe Madeline, the, the, your kind of gendering of, um, of Mimas yeah. as she, um, and I was curious about that, uh, about that as a choice or perhaps as an emergent property that you observed. But anyway, the, the, the sort of the gendering of the, the, of the machines or the creatures that you're working with on the one hand, and then the gender of the people, um, doing the work, uh, because, and Molly kind of glanced at this point earlier in sort of the transition from man machine interaction at a certain point some decades ago to human machine or human computer interaction but you also said Madeline I mean you've, you've both sort of touched on this the variety of alternative futures that are available are contingent on the perspectives of the people doing this work um, maybe you can, you can pick up any of that thank you yeah, I can touch on Mimas. That was something that that going back and forth with the curators a lot that they didn't want to gender it, and I kind of insisted on it. Um, one because there's she's a she because there's you know not enough women in robotics, so we might as well invent one. Um, <laughs> but but on a on a pragmatic sense, like you know, it was it's a big ask to take a 1,200 kilogram lump of motors and metal and have people begin to think of it as a lifelike thing. Um, so a really pragmatic technique is to give it a gender, just like they, they do for zoo creatures where, you know, this line is named Shelly, you know. So so that was that was a, a lot of what went into it and, and helping helping people um, see this machine that, that had no agenda other than to exist in the world. Um, um, uh, and and giving it a gender just to sort of put people off axis a bit. And you talk a little bit, we were, we were chatting a little bit earlier about like AI systems that are, you know, AI executive assistants are all female yeah. names. And this was a way of like, no, this, is, this thing is just existing here with or without you, it's existing. Um, Alexis Lloyd gives a great talk about gender and yeah. assistants and AI. Um, yeah, it's definitely a topic that um, is very present, I think, in both of our work. Maybe even if we don't talk about it as much, it's still there. Um, yeah, uh, I, I still get people uh, coming up to me going, oh, you build robots and you're a girl? That's a little bit weird. And well, that's... Exactly. Or who built them for you? Or yeah, that's that's a very. Um, at the same time, I have to admit that four years ago when I was uh, sh I 
showing not even the work itself, but kind of starting to conceptualize this. I was at some point talking uh, with a professor going like, and then this robot and he does this and then he's winding. He's like, stop doing that. Oh my God, what are you doing? And that was really amazing, both because that made me very conscious of um, how I'm not conscious of that, uh, but also it's actually really rare in my field to find people who are aware of these problems and can advise you on how to uh, talk about these things in a more um, aware way. Uh, I guess now when I talk about the work, uh, they're not gendered. Maybe they should be. Uh, I'm still kind of figuring that out. Um, I think, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on this. I think that, at least for me, that I'm co sort of a confluence of, of um, unusual things that you like. Usually, people who work with robots um, aren't artists or designers as well, as well as being a woman on this. So I think there's a couple of things that that sort of are fighting the the typical stereotype that that people just assume. Um, and I don't think I don't think that in general it's it's very. I haven't experienced anything very aggressive. It's more just been like a default assumption that someone programmed them for you. I have a question over here. Yeah, hey, uh, this has been great. Um, yeah, I, I wanted you guys to kind of project forward a little bit. I'm, I'm curious about, um, you know, what, like getting out of the lab and out of like fabrication settings, um, you know, how some of your ideas about like natural interface or legible interface with robots or like these collectives of robots, like how those how those relate, like how those could function in other kinds of spaces, like domestic space, like quotidian space. There's a lot of like, you know, um, assistive robots in hospital, like telepresence robots or, um, you know, yeah, just be curious to hear sort of like what are some less like, can you see how to project out into these other kinds of spaces with the sorts of things you're developing? Why don't you start with that since you were um, I think that's pretty much encompassing what I'm trying to do with my fabrication systems, to get out of the lab, out of the, out of a construction site into a space that we already um, inhabit as humans and have these robots fabricate, like have them be safe enough and non intrusive enough to be able to fabricate in the space we're already occupying um, and potentially react directly to what we do. Um, and through that form these spaces where the space is continuously changing based on its function um, and potentially without even, so there, there are kind of different modes of that, be that me as a designer or owner of the space deciding that tomorrow there's gonna be a lecture, let's arrange space in this way, or robots over time or machines over time learning how people respond to certain spatial arrangements and then kind of trying to predict what will be a successful one. And I think that's a super interesting topic in architecture and design to create machines that are both hardware and software to predict um, space, to predict objects that we will be interacting with uh, based on learning or based on um, kind of experiencing the space over time. I'm reminded by um, the quote of Ted Nelson in the software catalog, which is, our bodies are hardware, our behavior is software. I love that quote. Dan, there was, I think you had a question too. But the, um, just to follow, I guess, to build on what, um, what like Simon's question about how people, like, I guess how people think about how the robot thinks or, or, or doesn't think, or do they think about that? Like some of the, I mean, I guess in both cases, like I presume some of the visitors, Maria, to yours, see, seeing, seeing the things in, in use or actually operating, you know, did they feel like where if someone interrupted it or got in the way or felt that they might do, were they worried about kind of like the robots reacting or was it a kind of, I just, because I, 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 it seems with some of these is almost like this, like people developing a kind of like theory of mind for robots or a theory of mind for machines where we don't, we, we know that it may be, it may just be following instructions. It might be thinking for itself, whatever that means. It might be following someone else's instructions. It might be reacting to us. And I, I've, there's something about like, not just do we think it thinks, but how do we think about how it thinks about how we think? You know, is it kind of like trying to, but is it, you know, if, if like the people on, on um, Instagram saying they, you know, they thought it thinks this about me, or I think it thinks that I think this, and we get to this kind of uh, this back and forth. And I don't know, like, is that something that you can play with? Is it something that you could use deliberately as a kind of provocation or a sort of, thing to explore these levels of like you know people creating like essentially a fictional or maybe not fictional um sort of 
intent behind it. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, th I think that those are, I th you know, the for the for the robot in the museum in particular, that the level of intelligence is minimal, but the uh, uh, experience is real. The the emotional connection or lack thereof is real and tangible, um, and that as as prompts to think about technology's engagement with with humanity and, and society or without humanity, um, that that's that's very important. Um, uh, the so I, I I do my best to like the, the way that I design interactions is the you know the poke it with a stick technique like when you're a little kid playing at a pond and you see a frog you grab a stick and you poke it and you see what it does and that's how you learn what frogs do, and these are these are very new things for 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 people but we're we're seeing them in our in our cities and in our offices and everything and and um, we need to have some some way that they're not imposed on us that we have some agency for how these things are engaging in our lives. Um, I guess for me, in those scenarios, well, I've done this um, live or semi-live demoing uh, twice now, and both uh, exhibitions were pretty um, kind of contained, so it was more of a performance mode. So once a day at a specific hour, you can come there and watch the robots lay one thread. Um, but then what I did uh, after maybe day two, which was very spontaneous, I decided that I want to actually let people drive the robots because I realized that they don't understand what's the what's actually happening. Um, and it's really difficult, like it's a difficult process to follow both because of the scale of it, some, like something's happening here, then there's something happening behind you while you're looking at that wall. Um, and that was, I would say the most interesting part when people actually got to feel how tricky it is to, I don't know, wind this little fiber. It's like, oh, it's pretty much impossible to align it myself. It's like, well, yeah, that's why they do it autonomously. Um, and I think that was the most uh, rewarding for me and kind of revealing for the visitor moment when they're like, oh, okay, now I understand. Uh, like. I guess empathy for the machine for doing this com complex task or f for me, <laughs> I don't know. So I think there is one final question. Josh, did you have a question? Wait, here comes a mic. And then this will be the last one. Uh, it was great seeing both projects and Maria, um, seeing your work presented, um, it's really great. Uh, the questions for you um, in particular uh, I very much like the way that you're talking about sort of deconstructing the large industrial infrastructure of robotics, um, making it more accessible, dispersed, uh, ecological. Uh, and I wonder, in that process, have you ever explored or been curious about um, alternative kinematic models for your robots, like um, origami, inflatable, soft robots, um, things that move away from motors and, and axes? Um, that's definitely something I'm very interested in uh, and totally fascinated by, you know, continuously consuming YouTube videos. Um, I think my choices of actuators and modes of locomotion up until now have been purely functions like, well, I need a robot that crawls a on a wall. Uh, I could make it somewhat look like a spider but it's much easier to just have wheels like i've never i've always been very interested in for example legged robots but i've never needed one um the same goes for soft robots i'm kind of now working on a project that might involve that um but so it's th there hasn't really been a need up until now it's not because i'm against that or pro that um it's really very function driven I'm quite partial to your spatula robot. I love it. I love spatula. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'd like to ask you all to give a big round of applause to Maria and Madeline.